Hey everybody, happy Friday. Welcome back to another episode of Elevated 8. We've got a very special one this week with Hick Dog joining us here in a little bit. Uh, but before we get into the good stuff, we're gonna jump over and talk to Steve real quick. What up y'all, this is Steve with Elevate, here over at Elevate Premiere, and I'm really excited tonight for this amazing interview we got with Hick Dog. Man, this is gonna be dope. If you don't know who he is, I don't know what rock you're under, uh, but I got to say his dragons are phenomenal. I've got to hang out with him at some events. He stopped by the studio before and the dude is so awesome. So uh, down to earth. Uh, hey, anyways, let's go check him out. Chris, let's get this ready. And what up, big dog? See you in a bit. Peace out. Elevate mind, body, spirit, y'all. Thanks, Steve. That was super fun. And now our very special interview with Hick Dog. Hey, man, how's it going? Good. How are you guys doing? We're doing well. We're doing well. Thanks for doing this interview with us. We uh, really appreciate it. And uh, happy Friday to you. You as well. Um, so let's get right into it. How did you get started blowing glass? So I was 16, living in Albuquerque, New Mexico. Uh, and I saw these little color-changing um, fumed glass pipes that just blew my mind. And I really wanted to learn how to do it. And so I was talking with a friend one day about it. He's like, oh, I've seen, I know a guy that does it. I've seen it. And he was trying to explain it to me. And it didn't make any sense with the words he was using. And I was just like, I got to see this. Like, let's go over there. And he said, well, you can't just go over there. But like, if you want him to make you something, we could probably. I arranged to, to have this guy make me a custom piece. And I go over to his apartment and I'm watching him work out of a, you know, on a card table with a box fan in the window out of his apartment making this uh, glass piece for me and I'm asking him questions and I start to get ideas like, oh, he's, you know, telling me how he's fumed it and he's striping it with this clear rod. And I start having ideas of like, I could do it like this or I could do it like that. And um, I told him, I said, man, this is really cool. Do you make a living doing this? And he said, yeah, I pay for my apartment here and this is what I do. And I said, well, man, I really want to learn this. And he turned his torch off and he took what he was making and he put it in the kiln and he told me I had to leave. And he said, come back with 500 bucks and I'll teach you. And um, so I went and got a job at a powder coating company so that I could get money. And the first paycheck that I got, I went to him, paid him and took about two weeks worth of classes from him. And looking back now, I realized like this is someone that had a crash course from someone that had a crash course. And now he's given me a crash course on how to blow glass. So I proceeded to, you know, work the powder coating job to get the money to buy my first torch. And I, by the time I was 17, I had a torch set up in my dad's garage and was going to high school, but coming home every day and doing that and all of my free time. And, uh, but I really wasn't getting anywhere. I kind of was developing a lot of bad habits. And for over a year, I struggled to try to do this in my dad's garage. And this was back in 1997. You know, I didn't have internet. I didn't have videos. I It took me to give you an idea, not to be like that guy that's like back in my day, but to give you an idea of how slow things were for me in my progression in the beginning. From the day that I decided I wanted to buy a torch, I had to call information 1411 and tell them about this place that I heard of called Glasscraft. And they asked me what city and I didn't know what city, so they couldn't help me. So two weeks later, I saw this guy again that gave me my classes and I asked him um, what the city was. And he told me, and I went back home and I called information and I got the phone number and I called Glasscraft up and I said, I want to buy a torch. And they were like, well, we sell a lot of torches. What torch do you want? And I was just like, I have no idea. Like, uh, and they said, oh, well, let us send you a catalog. So two weeks later, I get a catalog. So it's now been almost a month from the day I decided I wanted to buy a torch until I actually had a catalog in my hand to look at to try to pick a torch out. So the whole process just even for me to buy a torch took well over a month. And um, but I struggled in my dad's garage for a year. And then I uh, was 18 at that point. And I found a place in Boulder, Colorado that did it professionally. It was a studio that was owned by three guys. One of the three owners was Steve Sizelove. And I kind of lucked out and just had good timing and went up there and got a job. Um, I was 18 years old and working at Diablo Glass in Boulder and making pipes for a living and thought it was amazing. And um, 
I did that for two years and then I went out on my own and I've been on my own since. Uh, I've been doing this for 24 years now. Nice, nice. So what sort of things did you start making when it was just you and your dad's garage? Um, well, one of the first educational materials I had was a book from Homer Hoyt, which it's a blue book that most glass blowers, lamp workers have seen at some point. Um, that was the only book that I had on any kind of instruction. And so I made everything that was in that book and it starts with little tiny sculptures of turtles. And I made dolphins because my mom collected dolphins and they were easy enough for me to make. And, um, and then of course I kept trying to make little peanut pipes. And um, I finally got a case of peanut pipes, like $10 pipes had about 20 of them in a case and I scheduled with a store in Albuquerque to go sell it to them and they were crappy you know like the mouthpieces were wrong the ball holes were off the carbs were off but they were functional and they were my best work at the moment and uh I remember driving down there I wasn't driving I was sitting in the passenger seat and I was looking and counting them all and, and getting a strategy for trying to go sell them well, I forgot to latch my case. And as I walk up to the customer's door, my lid opens and all of them just fell and shattered on the ground in front of his store. And he opened his door and he said, were you my one o'clock appointment? And I said, yeah. And he went and got me a broom <laughs> and I swept that up <laughs> and I left. About two months later, I'd filled that case up again because I only got to work a couple hours a, a night. You know, I had a little tiny oxygen bottle about this big that would work for about two hours. And um, so it took me a while. I filled another case up and then I got into a car accident and all those got shattered too. So my first two cases of actual sellable stuff was, was all trashed, so. Wow, wow. Um, did you keep any or anything else besides like all that stuff that obviously broke? Do you have any of those old uh, first pieces that you made? I do and I'll, I can grab it real quick. If you give me a second. Oh, sweet. I have a box here as some of the stuff from when I first started every now and then I show it to people because it's good to, uh, it's good to show some of the new guys that start out with such high expectations where some of us actually began. Like that's an actual functional sellable. Well, I shouldn't say sellable. But that was one of the pipes that I made in the beginning. I did not nice. melt things in. I did not shape a mouthpiece. I literally just knew how to draw on it and stretch it. Um, this was one of the dolphins that I had made. Oh, that's very cool. And then most of what I tried to make broke. Like this was a something I probably was trying to make an inside out pipe with this and it broke. So I turned it into a mushroom or like, Like most of my pipes, I'd go to finish the mouthpiece and the mouthpiece would break. So I'd turn them into these little guys that looked like they had hair. I'd try to make like little vases, but again, I didn't even have a kiln at that point. I had a pot of vermiculite on a hot plate. Nice. Some of these new glass blowers today will be like vermiculite. What? I've never even right. seen that, you know? Yeah, yeah, definitely. Um, but from that to this. Yeah. This is a piece that's about to get sandblasted today, actually right after this interview. Very cool. Very cool. Is that a solo piece? Uh, this is actually a collab with uh, the artist Dapo. He did the Millie work. I don't know how well you'll be able to see that, but oh, in yeah. each of the teeth, all the teeth and all the horns all have um, some of his Millie work down in the bottom of them. Oh, nice, nice, very cool, very cool piece. But yeah, it definitely shows that you can start anywhere and end up there with time and practice. Absolutely. Um, so you mentioned uh, Steve Sizelove and uh, that other guy in the apartment. Would you consider either of them mentors early on in your career? 
Uh, definitely Steve was. He was the first glass blower that I saw that like really knew what he was doing. That was, had really clean work even back then in in '98. And um, I immediately aspired to be as good as him. I always told him like, Steve, I'm going to be as good as you. I'm going to be better than you. And he would always laugh and be like, I'm always going to have five years ahead of you. So, um, but yeah, so he definitely was very influential to me in the first part of my career. Um, he also told me one day, Robert Nicholson was coming to do a workshop at Glasscraft. And, you know, I was in Boulder, which was half an hour away. And Steve told me, James, you should take that workshop. And I was like, I don't have 500 bucks. He's like, put it on a credit card. Like, take that workshop. Don't miss it. It's worth it. You won't regret it. And he was right. I, me and my friend Christian Luginger both went to that Robert Mickelson workshop at Glasscraft. And that also was, you know, life changing for me, I guess, in a way. Um, but I would actually also say that about every class that I've ever taken to do with glass. Like, each class I've every video I've bought every all the money that I've ever spent on education for this has always been worth it and um and every time I've taken a workshop or a class even every time I've taught a workshop in a class I could come out of it knowing more and um being a better artist than I was before nice so that leads me right into my next question was how many classes if any have you, have you taken and so it sounds like you've taken a couple Oh, gosh, over the years, I mean, I find a way to attend something, a demo or a workshop every almost every year. So and I've been doing this for 24 years. Um, I Lauren Stump was a, a workshop that was really instrumental to me. Got to watch him work on Murini and see how he went about some of his large scale soft glass sculptures. And um, of course, that workshop with uh, Robert Mickelson. And then I took a couple with Mylon Townsend back in the day and um, those were early in my career those were like really pivotal things that you know kept driving me and propelling me forward all right very cool all right. how many classes have you taught personally uh, that's another difficult question to answer because I was the lead instructor at the Mesa Arts Center here in Mesa Arizona for many years and so I taught small classes to like regular individuals, like anyone from a 16 year old to a 60 year old that just came from the surrounding area would come in and take classes. Like some of the classes would be set up to where it'd be like every Friday night for three or four or five weeks, I'd see the same people and teach them things. So I've taught a lot of little classes and then I've done a handful of larger scale workshops where you know people flew out to be at a studio for three days and um, you know, we me and another artist taught and made a piece a very comprehensive piece during it nice very cool very cool um where do you get the inspiration for your creativity with glass were you have you always been an artistic person i have i growing up i was always trying to be creative and my family all recognized that i was the more creative one out of all of them i'm the youngest of four and, you know, my brothers are both mechanical engineers and my dad is like very, I, I grow up in a family that's very mechanically inclined, if you will. And they yeah. always, you know, were telling me that I was the artist and was different than them. And, but, you know, I was terrible. Like I was a horrible drawer and couldn't, terrible with clay. I tried to airbrush for, for a couple of years and um, I just, I can't draw to save my life. I can't even write my name nicely. And um, so I was never very good at any of it. I always felt like I was just a wannabe artist. And then I found glass blowing. And I guess just because I've stuck with it so long, I've gotten skilled at it. I still don't feel like I'm some phenomenal artist compared to my inspirations. But, um, but I did this long enough to get good at it and be able to make, you know, things far nicer than I ever dreamed of and as far as my inspiration I would say it tends to be other artists like the things that I see other artists make and do blow my mind and inspire me and they make me feel these things when I see them and I always have wanted to be able to do that like make something that somebody sees and it just blows their mind and makes them feel all types of things and inspires them the way other people's artwork has inspired me. All right. 
um, so where a lot of your work in, incorporates like bones and skulls and stuff, where did you, or how long, how far along in your career did you start creating those type of imagery? And then when did you decide to like stick with that? Um, it was in 2015 when I was seeking, you know, I looked around and saw like, man, most of these artists that really have their own style and their own niche also have a pendant that works for them that anytime you see it, you know, it's who, who it is, you know, and I was searching for that for myself and a friend of mine, she told me, well, you're hick dog. Why don't you make a cow skull? And I had never, you know, I, I worked on a ranch when I was young. It's part of why I got the name hick dog. I was a cowboy in my former life. And um, I, but I was never into like Western decor for myself and never thought about like having a cow skull or anything around my house. But when she sent me a picture of a cow skull, I was like, you know what, she's right. That makes sense. And it's authentic to myself in a way. And so I made a cow skull and it, I posted it and it sold in like five minutes. And I was just like, wow, people like this. So I kept making more of those. And in that same week, I was thinking to myself, well, all right, I'm not the big Western person, even though, you know, I have the name Hick Dog and, and all that, but I'm like more into fantasy and things. So I thought if people like a cow skull, then they'll love a dragon skull, right? So I started making some dragon skulls, but they took me longer and I had to sell them for more. And at the time, they just, I night and people weren't really hitting on them. They didn't really pick up at first. And then after about two years of me making cow skulls and then occasionally a dragon skull, I, um, I decided to make a full on dragon skeleton. Um, and well, no, that's not right. I decided I wanted to make a throne. Like I imagined what if someone went out and slayed a dragon and took their bones and made a throne out of dragon bones, what would that look like? So I set out to make that and I made all the bones of a dragon skeleton not knowing how to put this throne together and in the end I kind of chickened out and was like I don't know how to do that and I just made a dragon skeleton and it was the first one and people flipped out over it and some of my biggest inspirations came to me and told me how great it was and um, so I knew that I had found something and you know I've made some dragons over the years I feel like a dragon is kind of almost a rite of passage for glass blowers that at some point most glass blowers are going to try their hand at a dragon but there's already such established dragon makers, if you will, with Skaz and Joe Peters and Mike Luna that I didn't want to be trying to compete or, I mean, step on their toes or, you know what I mean? Like I wanted to find my own voice with it. And when I made a dragon skeleton, I realized like, there it is. Like that's something that nobody else is making right now that I can do that I know is, is my work, you know? And um, so that's, I guess, right about then was when it really kind of got cemented that, that, you know, people started talking about the dragon slayer and the slain dragons. And, um, and so I've plugged away at that since. And I still make the cow skulls as well. I call them cannibals. It's a play on words. Um, but, you know, I guess like anything, like you don't really own something like a cow skull is something that we see no artist gets to own that a dragon skull well that's fantasy we get to invent what that is so um that's kind of fun nice nice yeah definitely when i first ran into your work i don't remember how long ago it was but it was uh, a cannibal pendant and it was i don't i don't even i can't picture it right now but i remember seeing it and being like whoa who is that go onto your page and then like scrolling through and seeing all of these different iterations of like that same sort of like outline or framework for a pendant. And I thought that was really cool and really unique. Thank you. Um, have you ever shelved a technique for like a number of years or a certain period of time where you were like going down a path with a certain technique and then diverted to doing something else? Um. Yeah, I guess that's probably happened quite a bit in my life. I mean, in the first 12 years of doing this, I did mostly production work. Um, and I did a lot of inside out and a lot of fume work. And then I kind of have stopped that. Like, I don't do, really do inside out work much anymore. Um, and I, I occasionally fume stuff, but not as much as I used to. Um, also, like with Mirini, I took a, the 
a Lauren Stump class and I came home from that and I made a Murini that was my initials, like a very small attempt at, at a Murini of my initials to be able to like stamp and sign my pieces. And this is back in 2000. And um, it, I made that one and then I never really went down that path again. And then just this year, or no, I guess it was just last year, last in uh, 2019 in January, I set out to make a real Murini of a dragon eye after making one with Dapo. Um, I did a, I worked with Dapo making this mushroom scene and he taught me quite a bit that, uh, you know, beyond what I already knew. And, um, and then I went home and tried my hand at an actual full size, like a couple of days worth of work Murini. And uh, so I've done a couple of those since, but yeah, that was like a technique that for shoot 15 years or so, 16, 17 years I shelved. Right, right. Um, and I would add to that real quick. I wished that I had learned all the techniques. I, there was times when I was like, oh, I'm not a line work guy. I don't want to sit and do wig wags all the time. Like, that's not me. And, or like, oh, I'm not, you know, I'm not a drawing guy. I don't want to sit and draw fillas all the time. Or, and, uh, and I think some of that was an immature point of view where I should have, and would recommend to other artists to like, go for it, go for all of them, learn all the things that you can. You'll find the ones that you like the most and you'll end up doing those and getting great at those more than others. But I still think it's good as an artist to be well-rounded and um, each of the techniques are just like another paint in your palette. Yeah, that's a, that's a good way of looking at it. I like that, uh, that analogy. Um, I scrolled way back on your page when I was getting ready for this and I noticed that you did or that you have done in the past a bunch of letters. Do you have a favorite character that you've made out of glass? Uh, it's a good question. I always really enjoyed the Mario World stuff when I made it. And I, and I really enjoyed the Bart Simpsons that I've made. Like I've made a couple of Bart Simpsons and um, one of them was a, I, uh, instead of Bart, he was Borg. He was a cyborg Bart. And uh, I just, I thought it turned out really good and I had a lot of fun making them. And... Nice. Very cool. Um, what are your favorite items to blow? Pipes, rigs, pendants? Honestly, one of my favorite things has always been uh, wine glasses, goblins. And again, this is something that the first goblet that I ever see, saw made out of lamp worked glass outside of what was in a book was made by Steve Sizelove. And he's the one that taught me how to flare a foot and, and shape a cup. And um, I still, it's my go-to. If I'm demoing somewhere at an event, people love to watch it. They come together quick. Everyone uses them. So they, you know, everyone has seen a glass cup and no, most people haven't seen how a glass cup would be handmade. And it, it's always something that impresses people, no matter what event, what group, what style, it doesn't matter. It's something that you can go and make in half an hour and impress everyone that's watching it. And then they go home with an idea of how a handmade cup is done. So, and then furthermore, I'd add to that, that I find that all of the most important fundamental skills necessary to be good at lamp working are exhibited in making of a goblet. So if you can get skilled at making goblets, then you can do a lot with glass. Nice. I like that answer. I think that's the first time I've heard that answer in doing the. Yeah, it's a, it makes it's sense old, when you think about old it. Old school and traditional, you know, but yeah, and it's and it's definitely like a, a form that everybody's familiar with. So well, they can see it come together and we're so recognize. Used to yeah, absolutely. And we're so used to making functional work that, you know, I've always said that people buy our work because it's art, but it's art that they get to use and live with. It's not just a painting that's going to go on a wall or, or a sculpture that's going to sit on a bookshelf. It's something that they interact with daily. And, um, and so function, the added part of function makes our work valuable. And the, I find the same thing is true with the goblet. It has a function. People can use it though. So it's art and it's beauty, but they can use it. So. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Um, 
what is your favorite uh, color to work with? Oh, that's a good question. Everyone would probably assume it's caramel because I use caramel frit for my bone work, but that's not true at all. I actually don't really love the color caramel. I just like that it, the way it works for bone work. Um, but, you know, it's going to sound maybe cliche, but I just recently finally worked with some royal jelly and it's just such a gorgeous color and it's so nice to work with and you can pair it with literally almost any color out there and it looks amazing and um, North Star sent me a sample of some some stuff they're working on that was by the time I was done working it I realized it was basically royal jelly but it was really interesting it came to me in a solid blue cobalt slug and I thought it was just like like a uh, deja blue you know but it said on the slug amethyst gold and cobalt and by the time I was done working it it was um you know it's this gorgeous nice. purple yeah such a beautiful color tone it is it really is rich and warm and vibrant and you know when I started doing this there was North Star had maybe 30 colors and out of those 30 colors about 10 of them were worth using and I even I bought a sample pack from North Star, my first order, and I still have some of those colors sitting here because they just were not really worth using. And so it's pretty phenomenal to see how our color palette has how far we've come with our color palette right now compared to when I started this. Yeah, that's something I'm sure not a lot of people who aren't too familiar with the glass scene know is that at the beginning or not at the beginning, but 20 years ago there was not nearly the color selection or the quality of colors that we have nowadays. And then that's no. an industry that's been expanding and growing side by side with the glass blowing industry. It has, yeah. And we wouldn't be where we are if we didn't have those color manufacturers making this stuff for us. Yeah, so. absolutely. Um, and then what is your least favorite color to work with? Huh. Um. Well, I avoided those colors and it's been so long. I think that maybe one of them would be Alien Tech. I fucking loved it so much. And then you make a piece out of it that gets overworked or overkill and comes out completely cracked and ruined. And uh, it's just, it's painful as, an, as a self-employed artist to work on something for three or four or five days and then pull it out. And just because of the color you chose, have it be falling apart. Um, that and then I worked with fade to black a little bit and that shit is bullshit <laughs> but like it's a neat color but it's just so volatile and it wasn't worth my time gotcha um what would you say is the most difficult piece that you've ever attempted oh I guess that changes all the time like Right now, I just started making these full-size dragon skulls, and they're not as big as some of the things that I've made or complex, but there was a, a steep learning curve for me to figure out how to hold it and get it together without it falling off the handle. But I guess the I would have to say that would be the dragon um, skeleton that I made with Windstar glass and Shaka at East Coast Melt this year. And um, it's something that Windstar and I had talked about for about three years about taking some of her drawings and fitting them in between the blades of my wings. And it was kind of an intimidating idea. And yet when we went to go do it, it, you know, it, it went well and, and realized that I could have done it sooner. It was just, I was intimidated by it mentally. And, um, but it's probably the most work uh, into a single piece. But, you know, as soon as I say that, I want to take it back and say that actually the most difficult complex thing that I've ever made is hands down a piece called Koyana Scotsi that I made with Windstar glass. And it's a cow skull that's about this big. And it's all made with little tiny like spirals of color and her little drawings fitted in everywhere. And inside of all of that is a full on traditional style recycler. And we had to even, you know, a friend of ours made a wooden stand, a beautiful wooden stand that looks, I mean, it's not 
I say stand, it's all, it's all part of the same work of art. It's all one piece. It was a collab between three of us and his stand that looks like Indian ruins that holds the piece. Um, the whole process was just so foreign. Shayla and I had never made something like that. She came over here, drove from Colorado to my studio here. And we, it was at a time when I hadn't sold anything for a long time. It was January. I was saving up for the trade shows that were coming. And so I was like flat broke. I needed to make small things and sell them. And uh, she shows up and, and we set out to make this elaborate piece. And we're four days in making nothing but prep and little parts. And yet we have no idea how to put this thing together. And we both got to a point where we started having like existential crisis and like anxiety and like freaking out that we had just wasted four days and had no clue what we were doing still. And we, I have a cow skull here in my shop that my friend Steve gave me like an actual real cow skull. And uh, I pulled it down and set it on the table so we could start trying to like figure out how we we're going to make all these little pieces look like a cow skull. And, uh, you know, it was probably like an hour we were sitting there having like, you know, crisis moment. <laughs> and suddenly we both like held up two parts and saw the nose of the cow skull. We actually set it on the nose of the cow skull and we're like, yep, that's the nose. And as soon as we did that, like from that point forward, the next eight days just flowed 16 hours a day. We were knew what to put and where, but it was all the way to the very end. Every step of it was foreign, made up, brand new, never done before, you know? Wow. That's, that's incredible. I, uh, you and a couple other glass blowers I've talked to on this have described that process like in detail, like like you just did, and it, it blows my mind to imagine going through, like you said, eight days, and then how many days before that that eight days of sixteen hour days, and then how much that just adds up to, just incredible, and then the amount of thought that it doesn't that doesn't get counted that goes into it, it's just Absolutely. It's incredible to me. Yeah, that's it's very true. You know, on something that you've made before. 10 times or whatever that's gone and you're just like you know how to make it and it gets better and smoother and easier and faster when you make something you've never made before there's always a lot of time and thinking i call it imagineering you're imagining and engineering how you're going to make this thing and um and so yeah like these dragon skulls i the first one this is the first one i finished i have two of them going but this first one i'm I literally spent as much time thinking about or rearranging handles for logistics, thinking about and working on logistics of how to make the piece as much as I did actually making the parts. So yeah, and it's often not counted, you know, it's on, a, on the first one that's there, there's always that learning curve that is there. And with each one that you make after that, the learning curve becomes less and less until it's gone. Yeah. And, um, you know, and it's it's kind of a it's kind of a mixed thing. I have mixed feelings about this. Artists or galleries and collectors tend to like to see you work through a progression on an idea, like make something and then make it again and again and again in all these different ways and iterations until you've perfected what it is. And I see the value in that absolutely. But I also struggled for a long time as an artist being like I don't want to make the same thing every day over and over I did production work for 12 years like I thought with art I get to make something that's you know not the same thing over and over and so for many years I was bouncing all over the walls you know just everywhere you like you were talking you looked back at my work far enough on my page and I was all over the map with what I was making and um so, but then when you do stick to something, there's also this other powerful thing that happens where you begin to perfect an idea and you start to see ways that it is wrong and ways that it's right and ways that it could be better. And then that what you're making evolves into something greater. And so I teach my students like make something that you like and then make it a hundred times and look at the 100th one versus the first one and you'll see a drastic difference then make it a thousand times. And, you know, obviously with all artwork, you're not gonna make some things a thousand times, but there is a lot to be said in going through that process of repetition and sticking to something. Yeah, um, yeah absolutely. And to add one more thing to that, 
Banjo pointed this out to me in a class. Um, he started making these Debbie cyclers and they all are the same. If you look at them, it's the same format. Mm. And he said, you know, it's like, it seems like as an artist, you don't want to be put in a box. Like, yeah, don't stick me in this box. Like I want to be outside of this box and do whatever I want. But when he, you know, like the Debbie cycler gave him a box and it was a framework and that framework allows him to get creative all around it. So he's outside the box creating all around the box, but the box is the same and that helps to be able to actually get creative with it because you're not thinking about how am I going to put this together? How is it going to work? How, you know, all these logistics, that's all solved. Now you get to just be freed up to be really creative within this structure. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And that kind of goes along with what you said earlier, where you noticed that all of these big names have like a pendant that sort of signifies their work and that they have something that's like a unique um, image or shape or style that's like a scaled down version of their work. Yeah, it's a, I think when an artist does it right, it makes it to where it's recognizable. You look at it and you know who the artist is. Yeah, absolutely. And that's definitely something that you've achieved with your work. Thank you. That um, means an awful lot to me because for many, many, many years, I was struggling, searching to find that. Yeah. Um, do you do collaborations often? Yeah, yeah, I do quite a bit. I mean, I work at home here by myself and uh, I have a second bench next to me for artists to come and work with me. Um, and I'd like to work with other artists. I mean, I don't know, I'd say maybe half of my work this year was collaborations. Very cool, nice. Do you have a favorite collaboration or a favorite artist that you have collaborated with? Yeah, I mean, it's easy for me to say that some of the stuff that me and Windstar have made um, in the last two or three years are some of my favorite pieces. Um, we both are, how would I say, um, we both really have a, a great appreciation and affinity for Native American culture. We both have some Native American in us and um, we I just feel like some of the work that we've made down that vein has been so authentic to us and, and I guess, meaningful. Yeah, I was and, about to say, it's been some really powerful pieces you guys have made. Like I got to see yeah. that, uh, that skull that you were describing earlier. I got to see that in person in Vegas. And I just stood there for a minute and just took it in because it was, it was, it was so much to take in. <laughs> it is, and, and you know, while we made that, we delved into the whole topic of um, the Hopi prophecies, and it's what that piece is all about. And um, it's something that anybody, if they want to learn more, they can look it up. Look up the Hopi prophecies. There's lots of books about it. There's actually they have hundreds of prophecies that many of which have already been fulfilled from their point of view, and um, it was. It was a, a life-changing and mind-blowing thing to learn about and to put that into that piece so that when that piece goes out into the world, it helps other people connect to and educate themselves on this topic that we find so important. Um, the piece has rainbows in it. One, one side of it has rainbows in the sky and the other side of it, there is no rainbows in the sky. And that's part of the Hopi prophecy is that someday we we damage the environment so much that we kill off all the birds and the fish and the trees and we kill the rainbow even. And that when the day comes that the rainbow comes back into the sky is when humanity will come together under one tribe of the rainbow tribe and, um, and restore the earth and restore humanity. And it's pretty profound stuff. And I really hope more people will learn about it and, and become aware of it. Yeah, definitely. Um, would you say that that collaboration with Windstar is the most amount of time you've spent on a single piece? I think it probably is. Um, the dragon that we made at East Coast Melt, there was three of us on it, and we all three worked as hard as we could for four days. So that's 12 days worth of work or labor. 
much. So that's getting close, getting comparable. Um, the only other one that might is a. Uh, sorry, if you give me a second, it's all my good. dog's looking at the mailman. It's all good. Little guest appearance from Hick Dog's dog. <laughs> Had to get a word in. <laughs> All right. Um, so yeah, I was saying that one at East Coast Melt is maybe close, and the only other one that might be comparable is a collab that I did with Christian Merwin that we called the Six Foot Dragon. That it took us. I mean, it took like seven or eight months to make it over time because we were working on other things. Yeah. And between the work that I, the parts that I made, and left with Christian, and then he did cold work and attached metal to them and made this whole thing that's like completely comes apart and transformable into all sorts of different things from a Sherlock to a nectar collector, to a rig, to a sculpture. And um, by the time, and then, you know, he got done making all the parts, the metal parts and making it come together. And then Raven Riley uh, electroplated it and did all kinds of hand worked electroplating and electroforming. So I don't, I can't even tell you how many hours are in it in the end, but yeah. those three would be the three most extensive of my career so far. Very cool. Do you have any large scale pieces planned out for the future? Yeah. Yeah. But I can't really talk about them. Oh, nice. So keep your eyes peeled, everybody. The, 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 the next coming. thing that I'm working on, I'm, uh, I'm, working on having it videoed the whole time so that we can put together a video of the making of it because you know cool. it's like you make something and it takes you know like that piece with windstar it took us 14 days like we woke up and showered and ate and worked and slept and woke and showered and ate and worked and slept for 14 days and i wish that it had been filmed and documented and people you know, it, nobody's going to watch you for 14 days, make something, you know, it's like watching paint dry. Some of this work that we do takes hours and hours. And, um, but taking all of that and condensing it down into something that's five, 10, 15 minutes that people can see the whole process, I think is valuable. And that's kind of where I want to go with the next couple of yeah. pieces that I make. That's a very cool concept. I'm interested to see how that turns out. Um, how much pre-planning goes into those large scale pieces? Oh, I mean, we've already touched on it some, but you know, it's, there's usually pages of sketches and I'm not a, I'm not a drawer. I don't sketch very well. I occasionally sketch things just to be like, Oh, we need this part and we need this part and we need that part. And it looks like a child's yeah. drawing. Um, but you know, it takes, talking about it like every time i get together with an artist i swear we spend two hours at least just getting colors and talking about what direction we even want to go let alone actually making something um so you know sometimes it takes a little while other times it's like you get with someone you're like hey i'm gonna make one of these that i've already made before and i'm gonna take your thing that you already know how to do and we're gonna put them together and it's like there's not as much planning or discussing it's just kind of right to it yeah but if, if you're making something new then yeah there's always a lot of planning and always a lot, a lot of putting the piece in the kiln and then talking for the next 10 minutes about what the next two steps are Nice. Yeah. Um, and then on the larger pieces, it eventually gets to a point where I'm making a list. I literally have a list of 20 things to do, like clean that putty mark up, bend this thing so it's aligned, and add this. Like it, it gets down at the end to where you only, you only have time when you're out of the kiln with the piece that you need to know exactly what needs to get done. So we have checklists that help us get through the, the final assembly of something. Nice. Very cool, very cool. Um, do you smoke weed yourself? I do. Nice. Do you use your own pieces at all? I do. Nice. <laughs> it's kind of funny to me. I, you know, I, I support my family doing this. I've raised two kids on this income and um, I, uh, I've not had a lot of money in my lifetime, and especially, you know, for the, last for the first 15 years of my career I you know was month to month on everything mm. and um 
so I've never had a lot of money to buy, like to collect glass. And it's always kind of been strange to me that I make things that I can't even afford myself. And I'm really grateful that there's people in the world that can afford them. Um, and I wish that I could buy some of the things that I've seen made, some of my favorite artists work. So I'd like to say that I have a collection of other artists. My collection is mostly marbles and pendants. And um, so the pieces that I tend to have of my own are the ones that weren't sellable. There were, you know, something wrong with them or have a flaw. So the pieces I smoke out of are usually a little jank, but I don't mind. Yeah, that's definitely the most common answer I get from, from glass doors. Is either <laughs> just the glass strictly joints answer. or cracked or second second quality pieces. Yeah. Those are the two answers. Um, what's your preferred method of consumption? Do you like just smoking out of a bowl? Do you like taking dabs? Oh, glass pipes. Nice. I mean, well, it doesn't, I guess to me, I, I like both. I've, I've been a fan of cannabis since I discovered it. It's helped me a lot in my life. I had really bad attention deficit disorder when I was young and struggled with school because of it because I couldn't sit still and be quiet for any length of time. And uh, when I discovered cannabis, it, um, it helped me slow down. It helped me have an attention span longer than 20 minutes for something. And uh, it, it led me to a career that has allowed me to be creative and make up my own schedule and, and, and live the life that I've wanted to live. So I prefer both forms and I just think it's always best out of glass. Nice. Yeah. I'm the same way. Um, you mentioned that you have two kids. Is glass blowing something that you'd pass on to them? Yeah. You know, my son is 18 and I've done stuff with him. Like when he was in uh, kindergarten, before he finished kindergarten, he wanted to make something for all of his classmates. And we came out here and he was like, dad, I want to take this yellow stick and I want to put this caramel here and a little black tip and a pink in here with a little gray and he made little pencils that are now known by as sherbert <laughs> yeah but it's uh and we made 20 of these little pencils and he knew exactly what colors he wanted to use to make them and um and but he burned himself and he was never i don't know he he's he is every couple of years he comes out here and i help him make something for someone a gift um my daughter, on the other hand, I think is more inclined. She's done it more and, and has bugged me to do it more. And she's more like me that way, where she's just a really, really creative individual. And not that my son isn't. He learned um, ceramic in high school and has himself a potter's wheel here in my shop. And he gets out here and makes stuff on his potter and wheel. And um, so, you know, it's... I. I don't know if either of my children will actually do it as a living, uh, but I could see my daughter getting into it someday. All right, that's very cool. Um, obviously, I know the answer to this question, but have you ever competed at any events? So I'll change the question to how many events have you competed at? <laughs> Too many to count, I think. Um, I competed in the Sonoran Flame Off down in Tucson, I think six or seven times. I placed in those all, all each of those times, either first, second, or third. This torch right here, I won at that event. And again, like I was saying, I didn't have money to buy stuff. I didn't have a fancy torch. I had a Carlisle for 17 years. And people, you know, my friends and stuff would be like, when are you going to get on a real torch? And, um, and then, and I just was like, I don't, I don't have $3,000 laying around right now, you know? So the day that I won this torch, I, I mean, I was crying literally just is like the best trophy anyone could ever give me because I feed my family with it. But every time I look at it, I see a shiny metal trophy and, you know, I dropped out of high school in my senior year. I didn't, wasn't in sports. I was never winning trophies for anything growing up, you know? And um, so I've done that, the Sonoran Flame Off a bunch of times. I've done the champs competition. You know, each year you have to qualify to be in the master's finals. So there's smaller competitions in the summer that I do that I'll win, you know, first, second or third place so that I qualify for the master's finals. And then I've done the master's finals, I think maybe five times. And um, I've placed as high as third place. And I've also won artist choice at that event, which I took as being as good as first place to me. Um, and, 
and then I've entered work into the Glass Vegas uh, World Series of Glass competitions. And uh, each year that I've entered some work in there, I've placed either first, second, or third, um, either with solo work or with collaboration work with other artists. And um, I'm really grateful for the competitions. Like <clears throat> so many of my studio upgrades have come from the results of the competition, some of the equipment that I have and even materials that I went through the year have, you know, made big difference in my life. And um, on top of just the winnings, the competitions made me grow every single time you do one. It's like a, it forces you to go through this kind of difficult, stressful thing, but it makes you grow as a person and as an artist and as a glass blower. So I see yeah. them, it's like, it's like when the Olympics comes to a city and it makes that city get ready for the Olympics and it causes, if, you know, it's difficult, but it causes a flourishment, you know, and uh, I think the competitions do the same thing if you use them correctly. Yeah, that's, that's awesome. That's a good way of looking at that. Um, do you still find that you have the same love and passion that you had when you started? That's a good question, you know, there is a certain magic that goes away once you know how something is made. And I used to look at some glass work and just like see universes in it, you know, just mm -hmm. sit there and stare at it and be blown away by it. And some of that magic is gone for me. It has been from for a very long time that, you know, the person that doesn't ever blow glass will look at it and see things. They'll even see your own flaws as, masterpieces or perfection you know and um so some of that magic has gone away but it's been replaced by this other like i'm at a point in my life where i tell people all the time i don't think we live in the information age or the technology age i believe we live in the glass age that right now everything in our modern day life is made possible in part by because of glass and I challenge people all the time that you can bring me anything in your daily life and I can find a way to tell you how glass was involved in it some way or another. And so to me, it's this, this miracle material that I think is going to carry humanity into the future, is going to help us with pollution problems. Um, there's just, I think there's so much that glass has and is going to do for us. And and the longer I do this, the more I learn about all the different areas of glass work that exist in the world. And the more I understand the material, it all just is becomes more and more amazing to me. And I know that for the rest of my life, until the day I die, I will not run out of things to learn and grow when it comes to glass. That's awesome. Uh, that's re really cool. Um, well, thanks for doing this with us, man. We really appreciate you. I'm all out of questions for you. It was super fun to talk to you. Is there anything else that you'd like to add? No, I'll just walk through and give you guys a quick tour of my shop. Oh. It's a little messy right now because Heck when yeah. I'm in the middle of a, uh, let's see, can I turn this camera around? Or do I just have to do it like this? So it's a little messy right now because I'm in the middle of, uh, of work and I tend to clean in between each piece. So here's my one station where I work. I have a small kiln that I do most of my um, prep out of, like majority of what I make actually goes in this kiln in the beginning until I get to assembly. Here's my second bench that's for when other artists come here to work with me. And then out here I have my larger kilns where I, um, as I get into final assembly, this is the dragon skull that I'm working on right now. Uh, along wow. with that to uh it's one of the two that i'm in the middle of and these are new for me to do a full-size dragon skull rig these are the first two that i've ever done right so there's nice. that and then looking good um and then this is i consider my little cold working area i have a faceting machine and a couple other little cold working machines here and a place for cutting all my dicro strips and you know a, a workbench I uh, got this little small tabletop lathe and I have another lathe on the way and uh, a little photography tent so that I can photograph all my stuff and then a display case to keep all my work until I ship it or go on the road with it for something. Nice. So. Awesome.
thanks for doing that little walkthrough with us. That was super cool to see inside where the magic happens. Yeah, I apologize for the messiness right now. Creation is messy, but uh, one yeah. of these days when I when I clean it real good, I'll post up a video tour of it on my Instagram. Heck yeah, heck yeah. Well, thanks again for doing this with us, man. We really appreciate it. Uh, you have a great one. We'll see you. Thanks, guys. See appreciate everybody. your time as well. And uh, just want to say to everyone out there, I'm really okay. thankful for anyone that's uh, you know ever supported my work, either through a like, a comment, a purchase. It doesn't matter. And I can speak for other artists out there when I say that um, we wouldn't get to do this if there wasn't people in the world that cared about what we do enough. So, you know, you guys are my reciprocal and I'm thankful that uh, I get to do this for a living. Heck yeah. Heck yeah. Well, thanks again for doing this with us, man. We really appreciate it. Uh, you have a great one. We'll see you. That was so much fun. Thank you again to Hick Dog for joining us for that super awesome interview. He was so much fun to talk with. Check him out on Instagram at Hick Dog. Uh, and now to hear, we got a little bit more time left, so we're going to hear a little bit from Elevate Dolls. Hey guys, it's Teresa and Brandy, and we're just here to tell you about the Elevate Doll talent search that we're doing. I would love for you to submit a video to us on what it means to you to be an Elevate Doll. The winner of the video will receive one of these beautiful rigs that has the Elevate Doll logo put on it. So hit us up, give us your video, and if you want to come here and record it, we can do that too. So talent search. Elevate dolls. Elevate mind, body, and spirit. Thanks again. Always great to hear a little bit from Elevate Dolls and about what awesome things they're doing and how you can become a part of Elevate Dolls. And now, to hear a little bit from Elevate Veterans. Hey ladies and gentlemen, Teresa here with Elevate Veterans. And today I'm here to tell you why we wear red on Fridays. So Fridays is a special day for um, our service members. Is it a day that we remember them all deployed, whether they're in the field, whether they are in Asia, whether they are in Africa, whether they are in Ethiopia, whether they're in basic training. It's a day to remember all of our soldiers. It also is a day to remember the ones that deployed and never came back, like from Vietnam, World War II, Korean War, Desert Storm, any of them. We still have POWs out there or people that have not been recovered. So wear red on Fridays to remember everyone deployed. We have our special Elevate Veterans shirt that you could order from me so that you could represent on Fridays. Also, I wanna let you guys know that if you're looking for someone to donate to by the end of the year, please consider Elevate Veterans. Elevate Veterans here is a 501c3 and we work in the rehabilitation, reacclimation of veterans back into society. With the help of generous people like you, we are able to give more glass blowing lessons, education, possible jobs, and healthy cannabis education. Thank you so much for considering Elevate Veterans as your end of the year nonprofit to donate to. Elevate, mind, body, and spirit. That was so much fun. Thank you again to Hick Dog for joining us. Thank you to Elevate Dolls and Elevate Veterans for informing us a little bit about how to become part of those awesome programs. Thank you to you guys for watching. We really appreciate it. We'll see you again here next week with another awesome interview with Elevate Today. Elevate, my body and spirit.